anything we can do with the dot product, we can do with the inner product. We can define orthogonality, we can run the Gram-Schmidt process, anything like that. So for example, let's look at the space of continuous functions from zero to pi. And that's that W be the span of the sine and the cosine. If we were working with dot products, we could look at a basis and ask if it's an orthogonal basis. We can do precisely the same thing with an inner product. Um, I haven't said this explicitly, but the inner product I'm envisioning here is the standard inner product on the space of continuous functions. So this suddenly becomes a calculus exercise. This inner product is one over pi times the integral from zero to pi the sine of theta times the cosine of theta d theta. The antiderivative of this is one half times the sine of theta squared evaluated from zero to pi. And the sine of pi is zero, the sine of zero is zero. This is indeed zero. And we have an orthogonal basis. What if we change our space? Now it's from zero to pi over two. And that changes our inner product as well. One divided by pi divided by two, two divided by pi, times the integral from zero to pi over two, F G D theta. And this space that we define now, this subspace looks the same as the subspace from the previous example. But in the previous example, 
we were going from zero to pi. Here we're going from zero to pi over two. So in spite of the similarities, different vector space, different subspace, different inner product, there is no earthly reason to assume that this inner product is still zero. And it isn't. Um, spoiling the punchline a little, but two divided by pi, the antiderivative is still one half times the sine squared. Now we're evaluating from zero to pi divided by two though. And the sine of pi divided by two is one. One squared is one times one half. We plug zero in, we do still get to zero. So our inner product is now one over pi. This basis is not orthogonal. We can do everything with inner products that we can do with the dot products. If we had a dot product and we wanted an orthogonal basis, we could run the Gram-Schmidt process. Let's do the same thing here, just to illustrate that we can. Here's the situation. Aside from the fact that this inner product is significantly more unwieldy than the standard dot product. The Gram-Schmidt process passes through. So V1 equals X1. V2 equals X2 minus the orthogonal projection of the cosine onto the sine. And now I am going to uh, wave my hands a little. The inner product of the cosine and the sine, we already computed back when we were checking whether this is an orthogonal basis. The inner product of the sign with itself is 2 divided by pi 
the integral from zero to pi over two of the sine squared of theta d theta. And if we did this by hand, we would use a trigonometric identity. Have to say, I'm not really feeling that. I used Wolfram alpha. The integral is pi over four, but we've got this two divided by pi in front of it. So V2 is the cosine of theta minus one half the sine of theta. Sorry, no, I just went to check my work and it's a good thing I did. We've got this one divided by pi divided by one half. So that gives us a two divided by pi. And this new basis may not look simpler than the old basis, but in one sense, at least it is, it is an orthogonal basis. If we go over to Wolfram Alpha and take a look, I computed this dot product and we do indeed get to zero. <laughs>